So let's talk about perception. The way I see the world is going to be different from how you see it, for all kinds of reasons. My culture, my experiences, my personality and perspective. But what about my language? Do the words I speak influence the way that I think and interact with the world? It's an enticing idea, but we can't determine that something's true just because it looks promising. I'm Moti Lieberman, and this is The Ling Space. Welcome to The Ling Space. So the idea that the language you speak shapes the way that you see the world is really intuitive. After all, if you know the difference between a guitar and a bass, but I don't, we're going to have a pretty different way of talking about our favorite bands. But it's only in the past couple of hundred years that people have started to seriously discuss the way one's language affects one's worldview. Now if you know some 19th century European history, this makes a lot of sense. That period saw a craze of nationalism just sweeping across the continent, with a lot of borders being drawn and redrawn. What exactly made one community different from another was an intense topic of debate. People thought that maybe there was something innate to national characters. And one way that this might manifest itself is in the languages people spoke. But early linguists like Wilhelm von Humboldt wanted to ground these philosophical notions in quantifiable scientific ways. Now this is an important step in getting to see just how impactful one's language really is. The idea that your language shapes how you think was really influential for a while. But unfortunately it had some disastrous consequences, and not only in Europe. In fact, some of the most destructive linguistic policies in America arose from the idea that indigenous language communities should be replaced by civilized European languages. And those policies were really ruinous. According to the MIT Indigenous Language Initiative, of the roughly 300 Native American languages that once existed, only 165 remain, and of those, 80% have under 1,000 speakers left. I mean, there are three times more Hungarian speakers in the US than speakers of the most populous Native American language, Navajo. And while we're not laying all the blame for this at the feet of ideas linking language to worldview, they did make a contribution. But for now, let's put aside how people have used and abused these concepts and just take a closer look at the salient scientific points behind them. The strongest version of this is usually called linguistic determinism, because it says that the way that we think isn't just influenced by our language, it's totally 100% determined by it. It's also known as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis because of a couple of important researchers who pioneered the topic, Edward Sapir and Benjamin Lee Whorf. Now this idea raises some interesting questions. Like if words shape how you see the world, can there be anything resembling accurate translation between languages? Or if you speak more than one language, is your worldview significantly different between them? But let's leave those for now and start with some really famous research done in the 1930s by Worf. He studied grammatical structures from Native American languages and compared them with English and other European languages. One of the languages he looked at was Hopi, spoken in northern Arizona, and specifically how people talk about time in that language. He surveyed Hopi vocabulary and didn't find any nouns that had to do with counting time passing. He also analyzed Hopi verbs as not having tense, so instead of having past, present, and future, they had different verb endings that showed how confident about their statement a speaker was. So that's really interesting stuff, and it's caused a lot of discussion over the decades since then. By now, a greater body of research has shown that Worf's assumptions about how Hopi works were mostly mistaken. But let's just pretend for a minute that they're correct. Let's say that Hopi doesn't encode time. Then linguistic determinism would say that monolingual speakers of the language have a significantly different concept of time from English speakers. They'd actually have to think about and experience the world differently because of the language in their minds. The discussion around this gets pretty heavy though, so let's take a look at something more concrete. Let's look at, say, color. Logically, the way your eyeballs and brain bits see color should be basically the same, whether you live in Toronto or Taipei, or whether you speak Mandarin or Mongolian. It's just biology, right? Well, to a proponent of linguistic determinism, not right. The words you have for color should totally influence what colors you're able to perceive. There's actually been a lot of research on this. It turns out that not every language has the same number of color terms. Some languages just have words for black and white. If they have more than two, so like three, the third term that they'll add in is for red. Then comes a distinction between cool colors like blue and warm colors like yellow. Which colors your language has terms for is directly related to how many terms your language has, with the same hues always taking priority. So we can use the way that different languages chop up the world of color to see how language influences perception. 
If you ask someone from a language that only breaks up the spectrum into a few big pieces to identify a color that they don't have a word for, what will they do? Well, linguist Eleanor Roche wondered about this too, back in the 1970s. She ran an experiment asking people to match and organize colors, but she ran it on speakers of Dugumdani, a language that only has two real words for colors, for light and dark hues. So what happened? People had consistently easier times telling apart so-called focal colors than vaguer ones, so ideal, typical blue rather than wishy-washy bluishness. And then, when she taught them some words to describe some of the colors in her experiment, they still did better with the ones that were focal colors. This strongly suggests that color perception is universal and not influenced by language. For color, at least, our senses tell us more than our words do. So what's the idea? Is linguistic determinism on the right track, or should we put it to rest? Well, on the one hand, there's plenty of evidence against it, like the color naming experiments. Or look at how often it feels like putting our thoughts into words is just too tricky and our language just won't come out right. If language framed your thoughts rather than the other way around, this wouldn't happen nearly as much. Plus, people come up with new words all the time, from subspace to level up. If there wasn't some wordless part to the thinking process, this would be really unlikely. Luckily, there's a way to keep some of the intuitive logic of linguistic determinism without it controlling your every move. There's a lighter version to the theory, which is usually known as linguistic relativity. This says that the words you say, the languages you speak, they might not completely rule your brain, but they do come into play when you think about the world. Like, think about level up again for a minute. You know about the idea of leveling up because you know about video games, right? If you'd never heard of video games, then you wouldn't have that concept in your head. But you do. So when you've gotten better at something, like expressing your emotions honestly, you think, hey, I leveled up. Knowing certain words can change the way you see the world, not to mention how you deal with the people in it. You share common ground with the people that you talk with. You all have a bunch of assumptions and suppositions about the world. So you can tell your friends that you totally leveled up at playing the drums from all the practicing you've been doing and they'll know what you mean. So it's probably true that the words and rules we have tumbling around inside our heads help us frame the world. We use words a lot, both out loud and inside our heads, and so it makes sense that they'll have some influence over our thoughts. But carrying it to the extreme of superior wharf style linguistic determinism is too strong. And it's dangerously easy to take that idea too far. But the idea that there's some influence of language on your worldview and vice versa is a good one, relatively speaking. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you leveled up your linguistic information, you learned that views linking language and thought have been very influential, if not always in good ways. That one of these, linguistic determinism, says that your language determines your worldview, that the strong version of linguistic determinism has been refuted by later research, and that a weaker version, linguistic relativity, better matches what we know about language use. The Ling Space is produced by me, Moti Lieberman. It's directed by Adèle-Élise Prévost, and it's written by both of us. Our production assistant is Georges Coulomb, our music and sound design is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Muse. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, and if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Hakone! <laughs>